done to all you brave souls that have ventured out into the high temperatures. It's not too high at the moment, is it? But they're, um, I think they're predicting 33, 34 degrees um, for us this week and even up to 40 in London, which is whew, pretty high. And for those in high money, in, in old money, I think that's probably about 95 degrees, is it, Fahrenheit? Something like 95, 96 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be this week, so it's pretty hot. So the weather, f the weather, how, how much? 28 is 82. 28 82. So I reckon of 32 or 33, must be around 95 yeah. degrees, something like that. So it's going to be hot. So we all need to take care, especially the vulnerable ones, the, the youngsters and the oldsters as well. Um, plenty of water, keeping the cool. The, weather, the weatherman I was watching last night actually said um, the best way to counter the weather is, is to um, obviously stay indoors, but to open your windows in the morning, let the cool air in, and then at about 10, 10.30, close all of the windows and draw the curtains, and that will keep the cool air in. Because I don't know about you, but we just like fling all the windows open and they're open all day long. But actually that lets all the warm air in. So a little tip there that I picked up on the weather forecast last night. So uh, Andy's still away. He's still on study leave. Um, so uh, uh, you're putting up with me today um, to lead the service. He's back in two weeks time. I don't know where that three months has gone. Is, is it three months, something like that? So he's back in two weeks time, which is good news. It'll be great to see him again and to hear um, what he's discovered during his times of quiet and on his study leave. So, as a church, we've been looking at world mission uh, this month. And last week, if you were here, we were listening to Christine and Pat talk about the Teso Development Trust in Uganda. It was fascinating. And if you weren't here, catch up with it on SoundCloud or on our website, because it was a really good talk to hear what was going on in Uganda. This morning, we are looking at Compassion, which is another charity which many of our church members are involved with, and Catherine's going to be coming up later on to um, talk about uh, her involvement with um, Compassion. But just to say, she is doing the London Marathon in October. I hope it's not this sort of temperature in October. <laughs> so she's running, is it 28 miles, Catherine? 26.2 miles for Compassion. And she's already, already raised a, a nice tidy sum of money, but obviously it's after more backing and support from, from the members of the church here. Um, so I think you can access it on Just Giving. Um, where, where can... Okay, Catherine's got a little leaflet to give out to, every, to anybody who's interested in supporting her. Um, we, as a family, actually support... Um, compassion, the Harris family, and we support a young lad called Asin Guza. He's funny enough based in Uganda, which we were learning about last week from Christine and Pat. And we've been um, supporting him for probably two and a half, three years. And um, it first came from uh, picking up a leaflet about him in the last compassion service that we had. Well, it must be over two years ago, I, don't, I think. Um, and we were asked to pray for that various people in um, the, who, who basically were looking for sponsorship for Compassion. And so we picked up this leaflet and we were praying for Asinguza and suddenly we realised he was the same age as Benjamin, our son, and his birthday was within two days of Benjamin's birthday. So they literally were sort of exactly the same age. And we really felt that was God maybe wanting us to take this young lad to our, to our hearts to pray for him and to support him. So that's what we've been doing. Um, he's a big football fan like Benjamin as well. Supports, unfortunately, supports Man United, but you know, can't get everything right. So, and um, we, we get we get letters from him. I won't sort of. We, we're short on time today, but I just wanted to read one part of a letter that um, I received from him recently. We we sent him a birthday present. So every Christmas and every birthday, we send him an extra gift, um, not a present as such, because they they say you can't really send too many sort of presents. Um, so it was, it was uh, a little bit of money. Um, it was, I think it was about £25 we sent him, and he was so grateful, and this is what he said. Um, he really appreciates the generous gift that you sent him. He bought the following, so this is with £25, a kilogram of sugar for 35,000 shillings, soda for 14,000 shillings, four hens for rearing at 40,000 shillings, 
two plastic chairs at 50,000 shillings, one pair of bed sheets at 20,000 shillings, four melamine plates at 8,000 shillings. The total for that was 127,900 shillings, which is about 25 pounds in our money. He, he doesn't have a mum or a dad, they have, they're both um, passed away, so he's living with his grandparents, and his grandparents were very pleased to have the melamine chairs to sit on instead of sitting on the floor. It kind of like strikes you when you get little letters like that. Um, his last letter from his Christmas present, he actually um, bought some pigs and some goats as well. So I dread to think what his home is looking like. It's probably like, looking like a farmyard or something. But. So we're here today to worship and to show our love for our God. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. What a fantastic reading. Just, just to imagine that God, with his angels, is rejoicing over us with singing. And we reflect that back to him in church this morning as we come together to worship him. So let's stand and let's just pray quickly. Father God, we thank you for bringing us all here today this morning to gather in your name. Thank you for each and every one of us and we gather to bring you praise, to bring you worship and to hear what you have to say to us. Please open our hearts, and Holy Spirit, would you move amongst us and speak to us from the heart of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. 
Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
Please sit down. <laughs> so Jason just shared now about their little boy that they sponsor out in Uganda. So I just wanted to show you, this is our compassion child. Her name is Marcelina, and she lives in Indonesia. And we've been sponsoring her since she was six. For a similar reason to Jason and Sarah, it was, she was about the same age as Ella, our oldest daughter. And so Marcelina's now 17. So it's just been wonderful to be able to support her right through and see her as she's about to kind of go out into the big wide world. And it's been wonderful. She writes to us. We get about two or three letters a year. We write back. And it's been such a privilege to be able to sponsor her. Now, in a minute, we're going to watch a little clip about a girl called Hilda who lives in Peru. And I chose this one because Peru is also very close to my heart. I actually spent seven weeks out there back in my early 20s, working um, on a seven-week placement, helping to build a wall around a school in a shanty town in the south of Peru. So we're going to uh, learn a little bit more about Hilda's story. And I hope you're really encouraged as you watch this just to see how the lives of children like Hilda can be totally transformed through the work of compassion. My name is Hilda. I am the eighth child in a family of 10 children. We didn't have much money growing up and we lived in one room. When I was five years old, my dad had an accident which left him unable to work. We had no money for food and I was very scared. I felt like no one cared about me and I didn't matter. Then, everything changed. When I was nine, one of our neighbors told me about Compassion at my local church. I was sponsored through Compassion, and I started to go to the project every week. I was fed there, and I learned how to take care of myself. I learned I was special, and that God loved me. My sponsor wrote me letters. They loved me so much, even though we never met in person. I am so thankful for my sponsor and everything they did for me. I will remember them until the last day of my life. Without their help, my life would be so different. All I can say is thank you so much for your love, which showed me God's love. Together, the charge, compassion, and my sponsors made me feel valued and gave me a new future. My name is Hilda, this is my story. Wow, that blows your mind, doesn't it? What an amazing story. Um, what these guys in Compassion are doing all across the world, the guys and girls, it blows your mind. Um, can't wait to hear more from Catherine shortly about um, the work of Compassion. So our children and young people are going to be leaving us and going into their groups now. So before they do, let's just say a quick prayer for them. Father God, you love children and you love young people and you have a passion 
for children and young people to connect with you and to hear your voice. So, Father, I pray as our children and young people leave us this morning to go into their groups, I pray that you would speak into each and every heart and soul and mind, that our young people and our children will catch a glimpse of you and hear your voice. In your precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. So, see you later. Children, have fun. So we're now coming to a time of confession, um, when we think about perhaps the times when we've not had our best moments this week, when we've perhaps fallen short of God's standards. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, for the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So in a moment we're going to say the words of the confession And then afterwards, we're just going to have a short silence to contemplate before we ask for God's forgiveness. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, cleanse us from our sins, and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I don't know about you, but each week when I say those words, the ones that really strike me are, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have not loved you with all our hearts. And sometimes I find myself just trotting those words off. But for a few moments, I'd like us to think about the times when we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and when we've not loved our God with all our heart, and when we've put ourselves first, and God and others second. Father, we're sorry for the times when we've not loved you with all our hearts, for the times when we've walked past our neighbor without helping them, for the times when we've put ourselves first, second, and third, and you and others behind. Forgive us, Lord, through the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews goes on to say, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So then let us approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Amen. Uh, Mo's going to come up and read our first reading. Uh, the reading is taken from Isaiah 49, 
starting at verse 8, and it's the restoration of Israel. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land, to reassign its desolate, desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, and some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. The second reading is, take, is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and Love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Just waiting for it to come up on the screen.
Ah, here we go, brilliant. Thank you. So, I wonder if you can remember a time when you have felt compassion. Oops. Oh, is it working? <laughs> Bear with us a moment. Oh, there we go. Yeah? Yeah. Good, great. Perhaps you felt compassion as a hopeful X Factor contestant enters the stage and sings their heart out, only to be cut down by the sharp tongue of Simon Cowell. Or maybe you felt compassion as you've watched your child or your grandchild um, play a match against a team that is much bigger, much stronger than them, and you've watched on helplessly as they've struggled to put up a fight. Or maybe you've felt compassion when you've seen a sick, injured, wounded animal, and you felt really sad about that. Or maybe you've been moved by images of desperate refugees going to extraordinary lengths to flee conflict in their countries and build better lives for their families. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, compassion is a strong feeling of sympathy and sadness for the suffering of others and a desire to help them. In other words, it's an emotional reaction to pain or suffering or vulnerability that inspires us to respond. And it's those two aspects of the word compassion that we're going to focus on this morning. So firstly, the significant emotional reaction, the being deeply moved, and then also the desire to do something about it, how it leads us to action. So what does the Bible say about compassion? Well, let's start with the Old Testament. Do you know what is one of the most frequently recurring sentences in the Old Testament? It's this one. It's this description of God. When God describes himself, or when the people of God talk about God's character, they consistently describe him as this. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And isn't it interesting that the very first word that God chooses to describe himself as is compassionate. And over and over again, this phrase is repeated in the Old Testament. Now, I'm afraid since I am a member of Wycliffe Bible Translators, um, you're going to have to put up with a little bit of Hebrew this morning, so sorry about that, just bear with me. The word for compassionate in Hebrew is rachum. And the noun, compassion, is rachamim. Can we all say that together? Rachamim. And both of these words are related to the Hebrew word for womb, rechem. Isn't that interesting? The very word for compassion invites us to consider a mother's tender feelings for her vulnerable infant. Compassion is an emotion that comes from the womb. So just like we saw in the dictionary definition of compassion, compassion in the Bible is a word that carries a lot of emotion. It's something that's translated as being deeply moved, but it's also a word that involves action, and it's most often used to describe God's action. So, for example, when the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, they cry out to God to help them, and he is deeply moved and compelled by his compassion to rescue them. And then again in the desert, they're vulnerable and God is moved by his compassion once more to look after them and provide for them. But we all know the story, don't we? The Israelites reject God's compassion, they turn to other gods, and not only do they reject God's compassion, but they fail themselves to show compassion to each other as well. And we know eventually, don't we, that that leads to them going into exile. But at that very moment, that very dark moment for the people of Israel when they're in exile, we see in the reading from Isaiah that God is comparing himself to a mother full of rachamim, or compassion. God is full of motherly compassion and he will rescue his people. That's the message of Isaiah and the other prophets in the Old Testament. And then we fast forward to the birth of Jesus and the New Testament. 
So in Greek, obviously the New Testament is mostly written in Greek, the phrase that conveys the same emotion of compassion is used 12 times in the New Testament, and nine of those times it's referring directly to Jesus. Two are referring directly to God himself, and the other one is used of the Samaritan in the passage we had read earlier. Now, I won't bore you with the Greek, don't worry, partly because it's a really difficult word to say in Greek, but the literal translation of that Greek word or phrase is very similar to the Hebrew one. It means literally to be moved to one's bowels. Now, that does sound a little bit old-fashioned and maybe a little bit painful, doesn't it? But in the Hebrew, in Greek thought, just like in Hebrew, the bowels were thought to be the very core of your being. It's the place where all the love and the pity comes from, not from the heart like we think of it in our culture. So those listening to Jesus, they would have understood compassion to be a very deep and powerful state of being rather than just a fleeting feeling like we think of it today. And we see Jesus, don't we, being deeply moved and having compassion on those that he comes across, especially those who are sick or suffering or outcast or vulnerable in some way. In Luke 13, we see Jesus referring to himself as a mother hen wanting to shield her chicks from danger. And it's this image again, isn't it, of the mother and the baby that we saw with God in the Isaiah passage earlier. In Matthew 9, we hear that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus, too, is characterized by compassion, which makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus is God himself in human form. Jesus became flesh to show us what God the Father is really like. And then, just as we saw in the Old Testament with God's compassion leading him to action, the same is true of Jesus. Let's look at a few verses that show that. Matthew 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And what did he do? He healed their sick. In Matthew 15, Jesus calls his disciples to him and says, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. And then, of course, what does he do? He goes on to feed thousands of people with just a few loaves and fishes which he has at his disposal. He does something about it. In Matthew 20, Jesus had compassion on them. That's two blind men who were sitting along the roadside. And he touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. He wanted to heal them. He wanted to do something about their suffering. When Jesus sees those in need, he never turns his back. But what about us? What does this mean for us? Well, as followers of Jesus, or as disciples or apprentices under Jesus, we are called to become like him and to do what he did. So we are also called to become people of rachamim, people of compassion. Oops. Jesus himself says, be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Some translations say merciful or pity, but it's that same Greek word that's being translated. And so we too, through the prompting of God's Holy Spirit living within us, will find ourselves being deeply moved by the suffering and pain and vulnerability of people around us because we know that God is there with us and that he is also deeply moved by the suffering that we're presented with whether that's people in our own family, or our neighbors, or our co-workers, or even people that we've never met before, but we've just heard about on the news or through social media. And as we keep in step with the Spirit, as we become more like Jesus, we will all start to embody the rachamim of God, the compassion of God. So when we're called to be compassionate, not only will we find ourselves being deeply moved, but we will also find ourselves wanting to do something about it. So just like we saw, sorry, 
so just like we saw when Jesus sent his disciples out back in Matthew 9, he didn't just send them out just to preach and tell the gospel and tell people about the good news of the kingdom, even though that is great. He also sent them out to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and illness just as he was doing. So as we become more like Jesus, as we follow him or apprentice under him like those very first disciples did, our compassion will also lead us to action, just like it led Jesus to action. So we too are called to participate in alleviating suffering and pain wherever we can, to take care of the sick and the vulnerable. But sometimes it's very tempting, isn't it, just to look the other way, just like the priest and the Levite did in that story of the Good Samaritan. Too often we get caught up in the busyness of life. You know, we find ourselves just so busy and and shut off to the struggles that other people are going through because life is busy. But equally, it can be really painful to see what some people are going through. There's something very real called compassion fatigue where we get so overwhelmed with pictures in the news about terrible sufferings that we just feel paralyzed and we're tempted just to switch off from it and pretend that it's not happening. But with God's help, we can allow ourselves to look and to be deeply moved. And with God's help, we can find the time and the space and the resources to do what we can through our actions as well as our words. So thinking about this idea of demonstrating compassion through action, let's have another look at the story from the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Luke 10 verse 33 describes the Samaritan as having pity when he saw the injured man. And in other translations, the word is compassion. It's the same Greek word. And what I think is clear is that pity or compassion isn't something that just momentarily crosses our mind. It doesn't just inspire a few words of sympathy or an empathetic nod. Compassion means action. The Samaritan didn't just stop he got physically involved in dressing the man's wounds. He offered friendship, transport. He provided ongoing financial support so that the injured man could be properly looked after. The Samaritan got well and truly involved in that life of the injured man and he risked his safety. He delayed his schedule. He got dirty and bloody by coming alongside a person in need. And let's not forget that those were times of racial and social injustice and tension as well. And so by helping a Jew as a Samaritan, he was putting himself at risk. And all of this for a complete stranger, just someone he happened to come across on his journey. In fact, there are more than 2,000 verses in the Bible that refer to issues of injustice and taking care of the poor. It's so integral to our faith that if you were to cut all those verses out of your Bible, it would just fall apart completely. It is that important. Now, as Christians, we can spend a lot of time debating about the way we do things, but caring for the poor is something that should unite us completely without debate. If we know that we should be helping the poor and suffering, then perhaps the greatest challenge is how do we go about doing that? We know that we should be feeling compassion, and we know that we should be doing something about it. But how? I mean, life is busy and difficult enough, and we all only have 24 hours in the day. But thankfully, God has an answer to that too, and it's the church, the body of Christ. With 2.3 billion Christians in the world, nearly one third of the global population is a follower of Jesus. And that means that there are Christians in some of the world's most remote, dangerous, and hardest to reach areas of the earth. And what's more, within the global church, we all have a wide range of skills. So we have people who can do everything from build houses and fly planes, to counseling, to managing finances. So together we are well equipped to meet the challenges of our time. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the people of God being the body of Christ made up of many different parts, and we all have different but equally important parts to play. So it doesn't matter that we're not all called to be overseas missionaries. It doesn't matter what your job is or where you live. It doesn't matter if you have a comfortable amount of savings in your bank account or not. We can all help. We can all be Jesus' body, reaching out to people of all nations. If you think again about the Good Samaritan, he wasn't a doctor or a physician. 
He was just a regular guy who happened to come across an injured man and he took him to a place where he knew he would be well looked after. He used the resources that he had at his disposal to ensure that the man was taken care of. And the same thing is happening today. Across the world, there are churches based in some of the world's poorest communities doing what they can to help people in need. And they are brilliantly positioned to be the hands and feet of Jesus right where they are. But what they so often lack is finance and support, which is where the global church can really rally behind them. Together, we can make each other stronger. But how? Well, let me talk a little bit more about Compassion UK. Compassion is a leading child development charity that equips churches in some of the world's poorest communities with the skills, the resources, and the finances that they need to reach out to the poor and the sick and the vulnerable within their communities. And the most vulnerable are so often children. Children account for nearly half of all of those who live in extreme po poverty. It's the children that bear the brunt of war and disease and often have no voice to speak up against the injustices that they endure. But the good news is that there is something that we can do personally for them. You see, Compassion partners with 7,000 Christian churches in 25 countries across the world. So they work together with these churches to support nearly two million children in poverty, providing those children with all the benefits of sponsorship. As a Christ-centered, church-based charity, Compassion is inspired to respond as Jesus did, focusing on individuals, recognizing their individuality, and showing them how precious and unique they are. And not only are these children being given practical benefits like food and clothing and education, but loving Christian staff know them personally. And they ensure that the children are given a chance to learn about Jesus and about his love for them, but also that they have a place where they can just be children and enjoy the freedom of playing with their friends. So where do we come in? Well, the great thing about compassion is that just as Jesus did, they make it personal. When you sponsor a child through compassion, you are committing not only financially, but also relationally by praying for the child and sending letters to encourage them and their family. And it's amazing how a child can bridge that global divide and unite us together as the body of Christ. Perhaps it's no surprise when Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 verse 40, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. To really show you compassion in action, I'd like to play you another short video clip. I think just like in Hilda's story we watched earlier, it demonstrates far better than I could articulate how responding to Jesus' call to have compassion on the poor and to do what we can to help them through sponsorship is actually a really highly effective tool to fight global poverty and reach the world's most vulnerable children. So this is Richmond's story. When I was eight years old, my father was taken away from us, and by that I mean he was murdered. Nothing was the same for me. News began to come to our doorstep. From our landlord, we got word that we couldn't stay in the house that we stayed anymore because we couldn't afford it. My mother had no job. My father was the only breadwinner. We moved from where we stayed to a place called Naguru Kasenke, which is one of Uganda's largest slums. And then I was introduced to our new home, which was a 12 by 12 room. I looked up on the roof. It was a tin roof that had holes in it. I've been to places where when it rains, people are happy. They get excited. But for me growing up, whenever it rained, that was a night that we would stay standing. Get little buckets, place just where the halls and the roof are, and wait until morning. A reality hit me that day. This was life. I remember when my mom said to us, there was no money for food. That ushered us into a place where we were now going to begin to go to the street to fend for food. 
hunger began to set in. Lack of water. I was a kid. I, I didn't have time to be a child anymore. And as I lived like this on a daily basis, poverty began to speak to me as a child. I felt I was nothing. I didn't matter. Nobody cared to know my name. I think the best way I could describe who I was and what I thought is the word hopeless. My mother, in tears, uh, approached one of her friends just to share with her friend, and her friend shared with her about compassion. Compassion staff members immediately came to our home. Uh, I remember them coming with uh, just uh, files to, to, to get details of who we were, what our story was. I got the news that a young lady, Heather, she was 15 years old, a teenager, but she had decided to sponsor me. I cannot find the words to describe the joy that filled our home when we got the news. Richmond, you've got a sponsor, which means you can now go back to school. It means food will be given to us because of you. I began to walk into that reality that ushered in me an opportunity to rekindle this hope that was taken away. Heather began to write to me, to hear words like, Richmond, I love you. Richmond, I'm praying for you. They began to bring healing into places that were destroyed by voices and poverty and my self-image. I remember my day, June the 3rd, 1996. I walked forward to accept the Lord Jesus in my heart. I began to feel, wow, I have been released from poverty. I have been released. God began to continue to grow the leadership within me. And then I felt fully called to pursue pastoral ministry. I began the Pastors Discipleship Network, a ministry that exists to train and equip pastors. And I spend a lot of my life training and equipping pastors in the Word of God. Looking back into my life and thinking where I am right now and what I am doing, I don't think any of this would have been possible without compassion. Compassion works. Everything that was placed within the program has helped build me to who I am right now. Poverty is not just the lack of money, the lack of material, food and water. Poverty is in, it's deep. I credit a lot of how I feel now about myself to those letters that I received from my sponsor. My name is Richmond Wandera, and I was released from poverty in Jesus' name. Incredible to think that one person's step of faith can start a chain of events that results in lives being transformed for the better. And we can all be a part of this important work too. Whoops. For just £28 a month or 92p a day, you can personally sponsor a child living in the grip of poverty and give them access to education, food, medical checkups, and an opportunity to hear about the love of Jesus. Through sponsorship, you can transform the future of a child and help them to step out of poverty into a future of new hope and purpose. We know that we're called to respond, and through compassion, we have a really real and highly effective way to make a difference. So can I ask you today to consider becoming a Good Samaritan and sponsoring a child? If you're not able to commit this time um, at this time to £28 a month, then please do consider giving a one-off gift to the work of Compassion, no matter how small. It all adds up and every little helps. So for both of these options, for either the sponsorship or the one-off gift, then please do come and find me after the service and I can give you this little leaflet which has instructions explaining how you can do both of those through my marathon sponsorship page. 
So to those of you who weren't here the other week when I was talking about it, I'm hoping to run the London Marathon in October on behalf of Compassion. There's a team of six of us, and together we're raising money to help fund a mother and baby unit in Kenya. So the money that uh, you give through your one-off donations uh, will go directly to help reduce infant mortality in that area of Kenya, to provide medical care in those crucial early weeks and months, and to set those children up for the best possible start in life. And of course, do stay behind after the, compassion, uh, after the service for the Compassion Auction. Debs has spent a lot of time and energy gathering together some amazing uh, offers for you to bid on, and all the money raised goes directly towards the work of Compassion to help fund the mother and baby unit in Kenya. Now, it's been a lot to take in this morning, so as we reflect on all that we've heard and seen, we're going to sing in a moment the song, There Is None Like You. And in the middle of the song, we find these lovely words that tie in so well with the theme of our service this morning. It says, your mercy flows like a river so wide, and healing comes from your hand. And suffering children are safe in your arms. There is none like you. Let's stand to sing. Please sit and Sue is going to lead us in prayer. <clears throat> before we pray together, let's be still for a few moments and settle our hearts and our minds before God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of life, an integral part of your creation. Thank you that you created us as humans, not only to function physically, but to have thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We praise you for your grace to us and your compassion towards all that you have made. 
Thank you for your compassion shown towards your people. We heard in our Bible readings today of the compassion of God towards the people of Israel and Jesus speaking of compassion towards our neighbours as he told, as told in the parable of the Good Samaritan. As followers of Jesus, we are also called to have compassion, not just to feel it, but to act on it, particularly as believers within the body of Christ. Father, forgive us when we feel compassion, but do not act. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring before you today the charity Compassion. Their mission is to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. We pray for all who work for Compassion and also all of the children who are registered within the program. Loving Lord, we pray that no child feels abandoned or forgotten and that young, vulnerable lives are transformed through sponsorship. Also, that the bonds between sponsors and the child bring security, unity, and ultimately a channel of the love and compassion of Christ. We pray for Catherine, who has made a commitment to raise money for compassion. And so we pray for the fundraising auction happening today after this service. Also for sponsorship to come in so that Catherine can run in the London Marathon later this year. Protect Catherine from injury or harm and anything that would come in the way of everything that she needs to complete in order to participate. We continue to pray for the country of Ukraine and every single Ukrainian. Lord, we stand with them in their loss, pain and grief. Please bring peace to this country. We pray for Ukrainians living in the UK and trying to settle. Lord, we know that the physical needs of people can be met more swiftly than supporting the emotional needs. May we remember that, that there are still family and friends of refugees striving to live in their beloved country. Many loved ones cannot be reached and there is no contact in some areas where there has been total obliteration of towns. All male family members have remained in the country to serve and protect. May we show compassion and love to every Ukrainian and do all that we can to embrace our brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit, be with all hosts and uphold and encourage them in their generous act of love and compassion to the needs of their guests. And loving Lord, we pray for the community of believers who worship at All Saints Muddyford, following a devastating fire at the church on Thursday. We pray that you, Lord, will be at the center of the turmoil and destruction. Rebuild your church as a building. Embrace your church as believers. And may their faith grow stronger as a result of the devastation, loss and grief that they feel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we remember all who need a healing touch from you, physically, emotionally and spiritually. And in a moment of quiet, we bring before you those listed on our newsletter or are mentioned on our prayer chain and those who are known to us. Bring strength where there is weakness, healing where there is illness and pain, and love where there is hurt. And we pray into your loving care all who grieve and mourn the loss of a loved one. Draw close and comfort all who mourn at this time. Grief can take many forms, and so let us remember and be compassionate to one another during periods of major life-changing situations and difficult circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, may our lives be full of compassion and demonstrate the love and true compassion of Jesus. May our eyes be opened and may we be mindful of others who might need our help. 
We have all been created with unique gifts and skills that come from you. May we walk daily with Jesus on the road marked compassion and attempt to support and uphold one another with small acts of love. May your Holy Spirit dwell in all of us and guide us to support one another, not just within the church here at St. Saviour's, but also our neighbours, our colleagues and friends, and the wider world as we go about our lives. May the love and compassion of Christ be in our hearts always. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Thank you, Sue, and um, thank you, Catherine, for that really thought-provoking um, talk, hopefully compassion-stirring talk, too. It certainly did stir something in me. Um, just quickly um, to share some uh, experiences that Sarah and I have had um, as sponsoring Asinguza. Um I would say that sponsoring him has, has not hopefully been a bless only been a blessing to his life, but actually he's been a blessing to our family's lives as well. Um, our own children are probably not really aware of poverty, extreme poverty and deprivation, but sponsoring Asinguza and praying for him every night before they go to sleep has opened up their eyes, I think, to a world beyond our nice, comfortable world that we live in here. Um, and he sends us letters, and our children hear those letters too. Um, and in his last letter, he said how proud he was that we were part of his family. So the blessings go both ways, not just us blessing them, but they also bless us too. Um, church family news this week, we're trying to keep it to a minimum because we've got an auction afterwards, which is the first thing I wanted to remind everybody about. Um, there's some fantastic prizes, uh, not prizes, some fantastic auction lots um, up for grabs. Um, the one that's catching my eye is the afternoon tea at the Captain's Club, um, but there's also a Sunday lunch at the Cumberland. There's a, I think there's a family swimming pass for Little Down, um, and there's also lots of generous gifts from our own congregation. I think there's a nice... Um, uh, uh, dinner or lunch that uh, David and uh, Margaret have uh, offered through so um, that will be immediately after the service um, there's 30 uh, really great items so I hope as many of us can join us for the auction afterwards just, and just, uh, just, just very quickly there is also a table with extra bits and pieces which didn't go into the auction which people can just make donations so if, if you can't stay for the auction, please just have a look on the way out as well, and any donation is welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Good. And um, a busy day today, because we've also got Messy Church, which starts at four as well. So um, that should be good. Hopefully not too much bouncing on the bouncy castle today, if there is one. I'm not sure if there is one. But, um, and uh, other dates are in the um, uh, church newsletter, which if you didn't get one emailed through to you, there are some at the entrance to the link with all of the dates that are happening, including um, Priority One, which is happening next Sunday. But everything else is in the newsletter. So we're going to um, finish with our final song this morning, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <coughs> Thank you.
I've just had my wrist slapped because I've said that a messy church starts at four, but it actually starts at half past three. Sorry about that. Um, and Jez, Jez is going to come up. He wants to um, mention something, a few words. Uh, I've been asked to uh, share with you guys about Matt Giddens' wedding. Uh, as many of you will know, he is uh, getting married, I think it's in two and a half weeks. I think it's... Uh, um, it is the, the 6th of August uh, it's in London and he just wanted to extend an invitation to all of you uh, and any of you who would like to go he would love to have you there um, so yeah so that, that's, uh, that's all you need to know Colossians 4 5 and 6 says be wise in the way you act towards unbelievers and make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone so let us all go in grace and love to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ Amen <laughs>